Why was the Hyperloop scrapped? Elon Musk gained fame for three main achievements, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Hyperloop. However, the concept of vacuum trains has been around for a century. Musk's idea, based on air cushion technology within a vacuum tube, is not practical. When he made the idea open source and allowed private companies to explore it, they all eventually abandoned the air cushion approach. In terms of the Hyperloop project, Elon Musk's contribution has been negligible. He introduced the idea with much enthusiasm, made it open source, and allowed private companies to take their direction. However, all of them moved away from the air cushion technology swiftly, signaling its impracticality. Surprisingly, a similar situation occurred in the latter half of the 20th century. Have you ever heard of the French Aero Train? It was an innovative high-speed train using air cushion technology, a time when such systems were classified as trains. The Aero Train held the promise of revolutionizing transportation. Ambitious visions were crafted and functional prototypes were developed, but as time passed, the project lost its momentum. The reason behind its decline was the rising popularity of maglev technology, which appeared far more efficient than the air cushion approach. This occurred during the 1970s, yet today, maglev trains remain relatively scarce despite their initial promise. The Hyperloop faces significant cost challenges and questionable profitability. Take the Shanghai Airport maglev, for example, a renowned project that incurs annual losses of approximately $100 million. Moreover, the initial construction expenses are exorbitant. To put it in perspective, the current cost of the Shanghai Maglev is $56 million per kilometer, while conventional high-speed rail in China ranges from $17 to $21 million per kilometer. Building a Maglev system could be up to four times costlier than traditional high-speed rail. Elon Musk proposed the idea of a vacuum chamber to supposedly reduce costs for the Hyperloop. For instance, the proposed Chennai-Bengaluru Hyperloop in India was estimated to cost $20 million per kilometer which was $8 million cheaper than the conventional high-speed rail being built there. However, Virgin Hyperloop One, in 2016, offered a more realistic estimate of $134 to $193 million per kilometer. In comparison, the California high-speed rail costs $164 million per kilometer. It's important to note that the high price of these projects is not solely due to being trains. You know, trains are not futuristic technology and they have been constructed at much lower cost before. The main factors driving up the exorbitant prices for projects like high-speed rail and Hyperloop are external. Building a continuous infrastructure throughout California involves traversing various private lands and densely developed areas, as well as geologically active terrain. Both high-speed rail and Hyperloop face these challenges, with the additional complexity of placing a vacuum tube over the rails in the case of the Hyperloop. Despite almost a decade of efforts by the private sector's top minds, progress in resolving these issues has been limited. It seems that both Virgin Hyperloop and Hyperloop TT are actively working on the technology. However, there are concerns about the quality of their work. For instance, Virgin Hyperloop's live test of a two-person pod raised eyebrows due to the poorly assembled panels with noticeable gaps and asymmetry. While these panels are not structural, they still reflect poorly on the overall professionalism and precision of the project. Moreover, there are suspicions that the pod's design might be a repurposed private jet fuselage, as evidenced by the oddly placed windows at shoulder height, indicating a potential lack of originality in their approach. That's right, the progress made by Virgin Hyperloop doesn't seem particularly impressive given the time span. Starting in 2014 and conducting a test with a two-person pod in November 2020 should have been achieved much earlier to be considered truly groundbreaking. If they had introduced a new, more efficient technology or made significant advancements in vacuum tunnel construction, it would have been more noteworthy. As for Hyperloop TT, let's examine their efforts and accomplishments to see if they have made more substantial strides in the development of this technology. Progress on the Hyperloop has been exceptionally slow and sluggish. One of the main reasons for this is the inherent contradiction in the concept. The Hyperloop's viability relies on long-distance travel, yet constructing extended vacuum tubes proves to be an enormous challenge. In contrast, conventional rail or maglev systems are far more adaptable to varying distances, making them more practical overall. Trains can adjust their speeds according to different routes, which is not as feasible with the Hyperloop. 
Even if there are suitable points for the Hyperloop speed to be effective, convincing taxpayers who ultimately foot the bill to invest in this costly and complex project remains a significant hurdle. And so, if you're a decision maker and propose a Hyperloop connecting two cities, you will have a rather difficult time selling it to people. You know, everyone likes shiny CGI and everyone seems to be uncritically accepting everything Elon Musk says. However, when it comes to their money, people tend to be much more defensive and conservative. And so, during public discussions of the Hyperloop, inconvenient questions might surface. Such as, instead of building this nice, shiny, high-end system, which is not compatible with everything else we have, why not just improve existing infrastructure? You know, Aunt Julie has trouble climbing up the tram every day because it's a banged-up high-floor thing from the 1950s. And then it chugs along into the city center at 20 kilometers per hour because the tracks are busted. You know, for her and tens of thousands of other passengers, a shiny new train somewhere far away will not be much consolation. And so if you have $1 billion in your budget, let's say, and maglev would cost $1 billion, conventional rail $500 million, and Hyperloop $250 million, in a private company's opinion, which one would you build? So just on the face of it, you could say, oh yeah, of course we're going to build the Hyperloop, we're going to save a bunch of money and have this new high-tech solution. But then some of your voters or political opponents might do some thinking for longer than five seconds. And so they might ask, hey, how come just maglev is four times as expensive as maglev in a vacuum tube? You know, shouldn't it be the other way around? Does this company have any price references from projects that happened? No? Okay. So is it a possibility that a company proposes a price at the beginning of a project and that that price starts climbing and climbing and climbing, reaching three to five times the original estimate at the end? Especially if the system only exists on paper so far and cannot produce any real life estimates. So you do see why a decision maker would have a really hard time selling this to voters. And actually, this is the reason why you only see Hyperloop projects in developing and or autocratic countries with young or non-existent democracies, because there, the people have little to no control over how public money is spent. The Hyperloop, despite its flashy appeal, is impractical due to various issues, making it comparable to the French aero train. Dictatorships often embrace such ambitious but unfeasible projects. Its engineering, financial, and political challenges render it unviable. While a few Hyperloops may be constructed mainly in autocratic states, they will likely disappoint, much like the Shanghai Maglev. Instead of benefiting local communities, the Hyperloop would merely speed through without meaningful connections. Thus, we should not take the Hyperloop seriously, and if they wanted to, I mean, for that kind of price, they could have just built four tracks and have the middle tracks act as the express service and the outer tracks as the stopping everywhere kind of service. But no, the Chinese government, an autocratic regime, by the way, decided that the people of Shanghai need a maglev. And so it was built and it's pretty underwhelming. It makes a ton of losses and it doesn't serve the community you know, unless you happen to be a commuter between the city center and the airport. And so I think this is the best case scenario for the Hyperloop. It's going to be this like ultra exclusive, ultra expensive, rich people transport between like a convention center and an airport or something, you know, two shiny, highly sanitized locations where mortals don't usually go. And so I think it is time we stop taking the Hyperloop seriously because it is nothing new. For the past century, we've been trying to come up with this, this one idea. The one idea that will whisk us into the future on the wings of fucking science magic, which will just wash away all our current, bad, outdated, old, no good technology in a tidal wave of innovation and genius. And such was the promise of the Aero Train, the Maglev, and now the Hyperloop. But all of them failed to bring about the revolution. Because turns out, in terms of financing, politics, and engineering, conventional rail is the best option. It is simple and just works. Thank you for tuning in, and if you enjoyed the content, please consider liking and subscribing. Until we meet again, take care.